a sequel, <laughs> numerical analysis two, which personally I prefer to the original, but you guys might feel differently. We'll see. Um, all right, so I'll just get all the syllabus -y stuff out of the way. About and everyone in this class is coming over from 460, 560, so and everything's very much in known quantities. It kind of set up as as last time, um, and. Uh, but I have the same uh, mirror website uh, where you can find all the usual information, uh, build this no studios, just like you can in uh, Canvas. Um, and you know, using the same textbook, just different chapters from it, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. As far as um, how things are uh, graded, so here's the, the setup for that. Um, so there will be Canvas quizzes uh, like last time, um, and then uh, uh, homework assignments and explanations from the text, just like last time. Um, so a midterm exam of a similar format to um, how, how we handled tests last time. So it, it, it will be a take-home thing where you post it on Canvas and you have a few days in, in which to do it. Um, the final is going to be different. Um, and the reason is that, while well, from the midterm, from this material I covered early on, it's pretty easy to come up with the kind of questions I'd like to put on the test, but less so for um, the, 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 the material covered later. So you actually have a choice as for as to how what, which which final you want. So it's very much a you know pick your poison exercise. Um, so um, one option. I'll show you here the assignments page. Um, is is a uh, fully coding um, where you're running that lab code to solve uh, certain um, nonlinear, um, uh, actually linear or nonlinear boundary value problems, uh, which are the last kind of ODE that we'll discuss um, in the chapter 15, um, using the methods covered from that chapter. Um, and so I have some skeleton code here to, um, uh, to work with, and you'd be filling it in based on the algorithms that are covered in that chapter. Um, and I, I've included some code that makes it easy for you to test yours. So uh, like here's a sample problem, here's the known exact solution, and so your algorithm will compute a numerical solution and will plot the two, and if they match, then you did it right. Um, so, for those of you who have more of an appetite for coding, um, then certainly I recommend uh, this option. The other option is, and some of you may have dealt with this, actually I'm not sure if you students in particular have, but I've done this in a number of classes, um, is uh, an oral uh, final, where we have a meeting in, in, in Teams. Um, well, actually, well, okay. I actually would prefer in person in my office, but I know for certain students that it's not possible, so in that case we would do Teams. Um, where I get to grill you on the course concepts for you know, like 45 minutes or so, um, and see how well you know your stuff. So, so, so I was just gonna focus on the non-MATLAB aspects of the class. Uh, for example, uh, you're gonna learn certain methods for solving uh, initial value problems. Uh, what are the properties of methods? What are advantages of one kind over another? Uh, things like that. Um, so I'm not going to like have you write MATLAB code on the board or anything. Um, so you have plenty of time you know, towards the end of the semester to figure out um, how you want that percentage of your grade uh, determined. Um, not too many choose a coding option, but some do. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, anything else here? Okay. All right. Yeah, we, have, we have a very lengthy COVID statement this, this semester. Um, <laughs> there is not really enough of a problem with people for you to solve it. But, um, okay. And you know, just like before, um, you know, have, have you know, these Cisco WebEx meetings uh, so you can. Um, attend that way, 
um, if, if, if you prefer, or if you're not around, not around Hattiesburg. Um, and uh, I've been posting recordings and all this stuff. All about the same. I should have said that from getting in left at that. It's all the same, <laughs> except for what's my fault. Um, okay. Yes. Um, so what is in map to eighty five? Because I've never done map to eighty five. Oh, uh, that is a first course in ordinary differential equations. So have you done that somewhere? Yes. <laughs> I kind of figured. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, because did, did you take six or five? I did six or Yeah. So you have to know your ODEs. <laughs> Um, well, any other questions about how the class is run? Okay. All right. So, um, so last semester, what did we see? We learned about solving nonlinear equations or root finding problems. Those methods will come up again um, in, in, in this class and, and build on. Um, also learned about methods for approximate derivatives and integrals, also polynomial relations. So, so a number of those concepts are going to be used in this class for solving various problems of importance. Um, and I'll get into that right now. So, so what are we dealing with in this class. Um, so first, it's going to be uh, tiptoeing into numerical linear algebra. Um, so how do we solve a system of linear equations, ax equals b? Now, in in a first linear algebra course, like our own Math 326, you learn about uh, uh, Gauss elimination and row operations uh, to reduce the system of equations to an equivalent one that is easier to solve. And, oh, OK. Welcome, Caitlin. <laughs> Not everybody's here. Um, and we do make use of those ideas here, but when it's a computer that's doing the work, instead of doing it by hand, um, there's significant differences in that process. And that's uh, one thing we're going to look at. Um, and there are um, methods of a very different character for solving linear systems called iterative methods. Um, so we'll cover one of the sections in chapter five to uh, get into that. So, so really what's going to happen is they're going to cover these methods, show you what's different uh, in a computational and computing environment, then explain why these methods are awful for a lot of choices for a lot of problems, um, and then uh, get into these. But, um, so, so we have direct methods such as Gauss elimination and iterative methods. Um, each situation, um, each type of method applies in certain situations. So we, we definitely need both. Um, but uh, you have to be careful about uh, what particulars of your problem um, in terms of uh, which one you, you use. Okay. Um, those of you who've taken Math 610, this will be kind of a review for you, but there's plenty of time to forget. Um, I think there's only a couple of you who've taken that class. So. All right. Um, then uh, we get into solving systems nonlinear equations. So last semester, learned about how to solve a single nonlinear equation using an iterative method such as Newton's method. So some of those methods will be generalized to functions of finding roots of functions of several variables. Um, so that's from, from chapter 11. And then um, the rest of the semester is spent on ordinary differential equations. So first, initial value problem, um, where the solution is a function of time. So we perform time stepping to compute the solution at various times. Um, and then we get into uh, boundary value problems um, from the last chapter, and that's from a coding option on the final. And um, solving systems of nonlinear equations uh, can be helpful for um, solving uh, ODEs numerically. What's interesting is, if you remember what you learned about in your first ODE course, uh, a variety of techniques for solving differential equations, like uh, solving characteristic equation and then getting your um, linearly independent solutions and maybe using methods such as undetermined coefficients or uh, variation of parameters, um, integrating factors. We don't use any of that stuff here. You basically just need, you need to know what an ODE is 
Um, and we work with uh, Taylor expansion, which we dealt with some uh, last semester too, um, and, and related ideas to design um, numerical methods for solving ODEs. Uh, what we saw last semester for approximating derivatives, the finite difference methods, uh, those will certainly be helpful um, for this. Alright, so it's 460 is really about solving your certain building block problems, like polynomial interpolation, uh, approximating derivatives and integrals, where those problems are really important as ingredients in solving larger problems. So what we're doing in this class is we're taking one step closer to real-world applications that feature system linear equations or ODEs all the time. Now, actually a lot of real-world applications require a numerical solution of PDEs, partial differential equations. Um, we don't get into that in this class. Um, that's actually the subject of a graduate class I taught last semester, Math 721. But those methods are built on methods, numerical methods for solving ODEs that we see here. So, so it, it's um, so there's this whole sequence of you know, 560, 460, 560, and 461, 561. It's all stepping stones, um, but we're definitely making, making progress. Um, so then you come out of this sequence with an idea of uh, all the techniques that are used as building blocks and techniques to solve um, the nastier problems, um, such, such as um, as, as such as PDEs, um, in, uh, um, in in like in a research setting. <clears throat> Okay, um, so uh, to get started, uh, we'll work with, uh, so we'll jump right in with solving AX equals B, at least for certain simple situations, and uh, get our feet with, wet with uh, Gauss, uh, Gauss elimination. Um, and even today, uh, for the first day, we're going to get into certain things that normally would not be discussed in an ordinary linear algebra course, such as that 326. Um, because in a class like that, you're solving very small systems of equations that have maybe, maybe like, maybe the largest matrix you work with is like a five by five. Um, here, this is about large scale problems. So some of the things that we we'll learn about in this class are used to solve equations that have literally millions of variables. Um, so this is a very different context. So, um, so the, the general problem we're going to be solving is stated right here. So A is a square matrix uh, assumed to be invertible. So this system of equations, AX equals B, um, is therefore known to have a unique solution. And how do we obtain that solution? Um, now, you may recall from previous linear algebra class that we have a formula, we have an expression at least for a solution, x is a inverse b. And I actually taught that 26 recently, and uh, a lot of time was spent on actually computing the inverse of a given matrix. And uh, that's one key difference between uh, analytical setting like that kind of class and here in uh, the numerical analysis setting. We don't do that. There's almost never, ever a reason to explicitly compute the inverse. Um, there are far better ways of obtaining the solution x than actually going through trouble of computing the inverse and then multiplying it by the vector b. Um, it's, it's, it's just not done. It's one of those cardinal sins of numerical linear algebra. Um, okay. And the main reason, not the only reason, but the main reason, is it simply takes more work. Um, it's, the, the goal here is to have numerical methods that are, um, that are accurate, that are efficient, and robust, that works reliable. Um, and computing A inverse and getting the solution X by multiplying it by B is, requires four times as many arithmetic operations as um, your approach I'm going to show you. Um, so right off the bat, that approach is out. 
Um, and, and for various reasons, it's um, the solution that you would get um, is, is, is less accurate. And remember from last semester, that we had finite precision. Every operation you perform incurs some error. Um, and doing A inverse B explicitly is going to incur more error than other approaches that we'll get into. All right. Um, here's another uh, significant difference. Um, in an ordinary linear algebra class, you learn about different kinds of row operations that you perform on a matrix. There's uh, scaling a row by a certain value, there's interchanging rows, and then there's adding multiple of one row to another. Now, the operation of interchanging rows in a class like that is generally only used in a, one specific situation where you're trying to avoid a situation where you're dividing by zero. So you swap rows and, and go from there. And that still applies here, but we'll find there's another very good reason for interchanging rows, even when it's not absolutely required, that it can reduce round off error. Um, this is called pivoting, and we'll learn about uh, pivoting um, in, uh, in a few classes. <coughs> Um, yeah, another big difference in the class like Math 326, everything needs to work out nicely. All your entries are fractions, things like that. That didn't happen in here. So, um, but you know, and who cares? You're not doing it by hand. Um, <coughs> computers working with floating point numbers uh, that may happen to be nice numbers, but again, it's irrelevant. <coughs> Um, and uh, I called attention to these criteria earlier. Uh, one thing that came up last semester was the notion of conditioning. A problem is ill-conditioned if a small change in the input can result in a large change in the output. So in the case of solving A equals B, that problem can be ill-conditioned, meaning a small change in A or B could lead to a very different, unique solution. Um, so that's a problem we have to contend with. So, how do we go about designing a numerical method? Now, we're going to focus on A equals B, but there are certain principles that you see here that apply for a variety of problems. So, it's sort of a recurring theme, and this, this theme actually came up last semester. For whatever problem you're trying to solve, you need to determine which cases are the easy ones. How do you solve those? And then, when you move on to a general case, is there a way to that's an easy case can help you. Is there a way to reduce a general case to an easy case, or at least do so in an approximate manner, if not exactly? Uh, for example, with uh, numerical integration, what functions are easiest to integrate? Polynomials. Okay. How do you approximate the integral of a general function? You approximate your integrand by a polynomial, integrate the polynomial exactly using interpolation. So here, um, to address these questions, we're going to see what kind of systems of equations are easiest to solve, and then how can we reduce a general system to that case. <clears throat> so here are some easy systems. So the easiest system of all is a diagonal matrix. So we have each one of our equations involves different variables. So here we're solving for x1, here we're solving for x2, and so on. And we call it a diagonal system because the matrix of a diagonal system is a diagonal matrix. The only non-zero entries are sitting on the main diagonal. Whenever I have blank space in the matrix like this one, but those blank spaces assume to be zero. So all, all the entries are zero except these on the diagonal, like a 1, 1 entry, 2, 2, 3, 3, up to n. So, trivial to solve, we just divide <coughs> um, each right-hand side value by the corresponding matrix entry, which would have to be non-zero, of course. And there we have our solution. So, we're only performing n arithmetic operations, just n divisions, to get the solution. So, so we certainly love that case. <coughs> now, here's a case that's somewhat more difficult. Um, is a, an upper triangular system. So here we have a 
differential equations whose matrix has upper triangular form. So all the non-zero entries are on or above the main diagonal. So when the system is written like this, you can see that it's easy to proceed with, with solving it because the last equation is just like one of the equations we saw in the diagonal case. You can just solve it immediately. Then you have x3, and you can substitute that into the earlier equations. So you substitute it here, and then you can solve for x2. But you substitute both of these into this equation, and you can solve for x1. Um, so we have to work from the bottom up when it's an upper triangular matrix. Um, and showing that process here, how we carry out the <coughs> this uh, substitution. This, this is called back substitution. Now, how much work does this take if you're solving a system of n equations and n unknowns and it's upper triangular? Well, you can see that when, as we go to each unknown, you have to do a little more work than before. Here we just carry out a division for that for our last unknown. Then for the second last, we have a multiplication, a subtraction, and a division. Here we have two multiplications, two subtractions, and a division. So the number of multiplications and subtractions keeps increasing. So we're doing how many? Zero, one, two, three, and so on, all the way up to n minus one. So if you add those numbers up, zero, one, two, three, etc., up to n minus one, what you're gonna get is a quadratic. Um, actually, it works out that it, this whole process for an n by n matrix takes exactly um, n squared, um, arithmetic operations. So it's order of magnitude more work, but in the whole scheme of things, it's, it's, it's still not bad. <clears throat> and then we have one more that's just the opposite of upper triangular, or lower triangular. So you take the upper triangular matrix, you take the transpose, um, the result is, is, is lower triangular. So the only non zero entries are on or below the main diagonal. And if you were to write out a system like that, it would work the same kind of way, except you're starting at the first equation and substituting um, from there. So you um, uh, so that results in what's called forward substitution. Um, so that also would take um, n squared um, operations, because it's really the same process as back substitution that's going in reverse order. All right. Questions up to this point? <clears throat> okay, now as I mentioned before, here are the kind of row operations um, that, we, that we can use. And the idea is now we're solving a x equals b, where a can be any invertible matrix. Um, so we want to try to use row operations to reduce a to one of these simpler forms, upper or lower triangular or even diagonal. And you did learn how to do that in a first linear algebra course. Like if you're reducing to what's called a row echelon form, then you're reducing it to an upper triangular matrix. If you go further and get the system in reduced row echelon form, um, then you end up with a diagonal matrix where you can identify. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to reduce the system to upper triangular form. Um, so, uh, so the idea is okay. So that, that suppose we have an entry a i j. Um, and i is greater than j. That means if the row index is greater than the column index. That means that the um, matrix entry is below the main diagonal. Um, so that's what we want to get rid of. So the idea is we want to take row j that's above this row, multiply it by something, and subtract it from row i in such a way that this entry will become zero. Now what does a row operation like that look like? So it's this equation right here. So this is some entry in row i. 
and we modify by subtracting from it some number, mij, is called a multiplier, times ajk, which is an entry that's in row j and the same column. So we do that for all columns. So this is another way of saying row i is equal to itself minus some multiplier times row j. Um, it's just shown one entry at a time. Now, so what we can do is we want aij, the new aij, to end up being zero. So if I just look at the j column, so I set k equal to j throughout, and this is what I get, and I want that to be equal to zero. So now I just solve this equation for mij, and this is it. So the multiplier, so the magic number you multiply rho j by, subtract from rho i, is of the entry you're trying to eliminate divided by the diagonal entry in that same column, which would have to be non-zero. So this is how we can eliminate entries below the diagonal, by this kind of row operation. Um, if this entry is zero, then a row interchange is called for. But for now, we'll assume that that's not necessary. We'll get into that pivoting stuff later. Now, here's something, again, that the not sort of thing that comes up in our regular linear algebra course. When you're carrying this process out, you're trying to minimize how many operations a computer has to perform. So what that means is, we don't actually carry out this update in column J. We do perform this, but only for columns J plus 1, J plus 2, all the columns to the right of the entry we're trying to eliminate. And the reason why is, in columns that are to the left of column J, presumably those entries have been previously eliminated. Because what we do is with Gauss elimination, we first eliminate entries below the diagonal in the first column. Take care of the first column entirely, then move to the second column, do all of those, and so on. So in these columns, those entries are already zero, so they won't affect anything. In column J, well, that's working on AIJ. We know what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be zero. So why carry out this operation when you know what the result is going to be? So we just, so we, there is this assumption of okay, zero. We, we need to update the other entries, and then those are that are crucial to the gas elimination process. Um, but in a practical implementation, um, you don't actually carry out this update. Not, not in this column, just in columns to the right of it. Show here just for concreteness. So here's an example. So this is from the corresponding section in the, in the text, uh, 3.1, that covered Gauss elimination. So, so here we have an example of a matrix um, that we want to reduce to triangular form. Now you may remember from your first year algebra course, what you often did in that class was work with not just the matrix A, but what's called the augmented matrix where you take the right-hand side of your system and add it as an additional column. We actually don't do that. Um, it, it turns out to be impractical for reasons that I will get into in, in the next section. But what, what I want to focus on here is just this part, the first four columns of this matrix, matrix A, we're trying to get that to upper triangular form. And so we see what happens is here we have a, this matrix where every entry initially is non-zero. So, so what we do is we want to eliminate this entry 3 here. 
So we take the entry one eliminate three, divide it by the diagonal entry in the same column, that's two, um, that'll always be above it, and three halves is our multiplier. So we take three halves times this row and subtract it from this, and we just have this, this zero here. But again, we don't actually perform that. But we do carry out the updates of everything else here. So we see that these entries in the second row all have to change. Because we're taking three halves times the entire first row, subtracting from the second. And then we continue. We want to get rid of this one. So we take one half times the first row, subtract it from the third row, and that updates everything else. And then we use a multiplier of five halves. And now the first column is all cleaned out. So then what you can see is, then when we need to go to the second column, we need to eliminate these two entries that are below the diagonal. And minus 9 halves is the diagonal entry now. So now, when we want to get rid of the 3 halves, for instance, we don't care about anything that happens to the left, as I mentioned earlier. Why? You can see from this process, it's 0. We know this is going to be 0. We just have to work on this. And so we proceed with the second column. Um, and we see that with each row operation, we're getting closer to truck. Um, actually, now at this point, the matrix, the original matrix A, is upper triangular. Um, and now this is the system that we need to solve. But because this is the reduced upper triangular form, we have a system for which back substitution can be used. So we can solve this equation immediately and substitute on up. I want to show you what's happening to the matrix as the process unfolds and see which, which entries are zero and how that affects what you do um, going forward. Questions about any of this? Flops, though. 
is um, so we tend to think of flux as a as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. But they're not the same. Um, that uh, if you think about how addition and multiplication work, is they're carrying them out by hand on numbers with a large number of digits. You can see how addition is so much um, a much faster process because um, if you have numbers that have p digits, the amount of work to carry out the addition of those numbers is linear in number of digits. But multiplication is quadratic because uh, if you think in terms of um, take, taking um, numbers of expressions of several terms and multiplying them, each term is multiplied with every other term. This doesn't happen in addition. So that's why multiplication and also division are far more expensive. So, um, so careful analysis of the efficiency of these algorithms takes into account not just how many operations are performed, but what kind of operations are they multiplications or additions. If there's a way to modify an algorithm so that maybe the number of flops is exactly the same, but certain multiplications are reworked to be additions, you want to do that. Um, because that, that will save time. So number of flops is, is a helpful measure of algorithm efficiency, but doesn't cover everything. Um, so number of operations that you might take for granted that are not basic arithmetic operations, like square roots or exponentials, well, those cost even more. Because how is a computer going to evaluate a square root or an exponential or a sine or cosine? Using some sort of approximation, like a Taylor approximation, which would consist, each one of those would consist of several basic arithmetic operations. Um, so that, that's something that needs to be considered as well. Um, and as, as an example of um, um, how much of a difference it can make if you um, can find ways to make an algorithm more efficient, um, a uh, the speed Fourier transform, if done in a straightforward way, is based on the definition, takes order n squared operations to transform n values. But the fast Fourier transform um, reduces that to n log n. Um, so having a factor of log n versus n um, makes a big difference when n is large, because log n is a very slowly growing function. Um, also, uh, things other than point one operations uh, can slow down your code. Um, moving down to rounded memory. Uh, like taking a transpose of a matrix causes all the entries to be moved around in memory. Um, so if there's a way to reduce how many times to take a transpose of a matrix, uh, then, then that would be a good thing. Um, and so much work has been done to reduce the number of point one operations, um, there's more of a focus on other transactions that a computer performs uh, to look for efficiency there. And computer architecture is always changing. Uh, we now have um, the multiprocessor environments. And uh, um, so now that causes or requires rethinking of what algorithms are best. Uh, certain methods that were designed decades ago and were determined impractical then might be practical now because the computing environment has changed. That's why it's important to not forget about what work has been done. I know all this stuff has been published somewhere, but it could easily be, be forgotten. Um, you know, lost the ages. Um, Now, I want to show you here. I've shown you the main step. Okay. This is what we saw earlier how you perform a row operation, the subtracting a multiple of one row from another. But how do we build an overall algorithm for that? Well, that you can implement in some programming language such as MATLAB. Well, think about how the gas elimination process works. We go through the columns. Starting first column, we go from left to right. 
So we have a for loop that, is, that um, carries that out. So J refers to the column of A that we're currently working on. So our loop is going to go through all columns from first to the second last, because for a square matrix, once you get to the column N, there's nothing to eliminate there. So we only need to go from the first N minus one columns. So that's our outermost loop. In here, within that loop, we're going to work on one column, eliminate all the entries below the diagonal. So we assume that there's no need to perform row interchanges for the time being. What, what entries are we eliminating? Well, we're in column J, so we have to eliminate the entry that's in that column in row J plus 1, J plus 2, etc., all the way down to row N. That's what this, this second loop is for. So now everything inside here, all of this, is meant to eliminate one uh, subdiagonal entry to bring the matrix closer to upper triangular form and perform a whole row operation um, that, that, that does that and update the matrix accordingly. So what's done? Well, we get the multiplier, and I showed you that earlier. Here we perform a row operation using this main step, and we do it for only these columns because. Anything in column 1, 2, 3, up to j, we already know that a i j is a i k is supposed to be 0. Yes, other question? Um, well, why wouldn't it start from k equals j? Because for a i k, i is at least j plus 1. Right. Um, um, it's, okay, um, I should say, why would, why would this, oh, yeah, sorry, like, I, I get that I equals J plus one. Yeah. Oh, but, but this one here? Yeah. Okay, um, that's what I was talking about a little while ago, that, um, because AI, AI J, we know it's supposed to become zero. So we don't need to perform this to get that result. But also, AIJ, because of the values of indices, will not play a role later in the computation. So, I mean, yeah, in a situation where you um, a future operation might rely on that and you haven't transformed it, yeah, that would be a problem. Um, but if you look at, um, what entries are involved in the row operation um, for a given column J? It's only used, this part only involves entries. Well, okay, the, um, we have uh, the diagonal entry in that column playing a role, but also entries to the right. So, so what, uh, this is what happens sometimes when, like, okay, here's one of the homework problems where you go ahead and implement this. Um, and then, so a student will do this, and they'll try it out on a matrix. And they're asking me, why isn't the matrix upper triangular? My code's not working. Like, well, actually, your code is correct. Um, but you don't see that upper triangular result. Because it's not overriding AIJ with zero each time. Now, what you could do while you're working on this is you go ahead and change this to the column J, and then you should see an upper triangular result in that case, um, and then change it back. <laughs> so, because um, it turns out that um, uh, what we'll see later is it's actually quite convenient to take these numbers, these multipliers, and store them in the lower triangle instead of putting zeros there. Because if you have these entries that you could be doing something with, storing something useful, and you're just saying, oh, it's zero. That's wasted space. Also, a very important consideration, try not to waste storage space. Um, so, um, okay. Do you want to answer your question? Or? Okay. So, at this point, gas simulation has been carried out. This part here is if you are working on the augmented matrix. And I mentioned, like, when we get to the next section, we're going to do away with that idea. Um, reasons that will become clear then. Here we're doing a similar operation. Um, 
where the element on the right hand side we subtract it, it itself minus the same multiplier times the corresponding entry that's in row j. So, so again, it's a matter of row i is equal to itself minus the multiplier times row j. Um, so if you are solving a equals b and you want to reduce the augmented matrix to upper triangular form, this algorithm will carry that out. Um, and then uh, you'll have this upper triangular system where the right hand side has been appropriately modified so that the whole system of equations is equivalent to the original. And then you solve that using back substitution. Um, but what we see here, to carry out this whole process, we're working on each column, several rows within that column, and then for each one of those, we're performing this row operation, which can take as many as uh, n minus 1 multiplications, n minus 1 subtractions. So we have three nested loops, each one of these loops doing order n work. Um, that's why Gaussian elimination as a whole is order n cubed operations in total. At least intuitively, you can see why it's doing that. But um, now I'm going to show you more precisely how we arrive at that operation count. Okay. So if I break down the whole algorithm um, and count operations and iterations, so like I said, these are the outer loop n minus 1 iterations. Here we have n minus j iterations for the middle loop because the first j rows are left out. The innermost loop, we're counting from j plus 1 up to n, also there. So that loop also carries out n minus j iterations. What happens when we each of the individual statements? Well, this main step, two floating point operations. Multiplication here, subtraction here. Here we have one division. Here we have, again, a multiplication and a subtraction. So I've indicated that here. So when you start from the inside and work your way out. So this inner loop has n minus j iterations, two flops per iteration. So that's what we have as a grand total. So now I add to that the three operations performed in these two statements. So this is what's happening inside the middle loop. So then I multiply that by n minus j. So this is the total number of operations performed in this whole part here, one iteration of the outermost loop. And we see it's already ordered n squared work. So then what I do is I take the sum of this expression for j equals 1 to n minus 1. So this right here does give you the total operation count of Gaussian elimination working on an augmented matrix. Um, but we want a nice, we, we want this expression to be close form. We can't actually evaluate this sum um, using certain formulas for summation. Um, now, did anyone tell me, here, uh, as I said, we're, we're, we have this step here because we're working with the augmented matrix in this version of Gauss elimination. Suppose we weren't, like if this step was to be left out, did anyone tell me how this would have to be changed? And if you look how it was built up from the inside out, you can figure it out. What in here would be different if we're not doing this? Only n minus j squared? Um, yeah. Would be... Yeah, this, this 3 would not be here. It would just be a coefficient of 1. Yeah, because we'd only have one operation here that would carry all the way down. Now, this is a lower order term. This is a dominant term because that has the highest exponent. So it doesn't really make a big difference to toss that out. But um, 
So now, this summation formula, uh, sum of uh, integer squared, will help us. So let's go ahead and work out the summation. So I expand everything, use properties of summation, so I break it down into separate summations, factor out anything that I can, like anything that doesn't depend on j, I can factor out because I'm summing over j. Um, here we're summing up 1, n minus 1 times. So this summation turns out to be just n minus 1. So I can do that with a couple of these. And then these three summations are left. So I use this formula for the second one. For this one, I use a familiar formula that Gauss came up with for the sum of the first so many integers. And now I just do a whole lot of algebra and simplify everything. And I'm really only interested in the leading term, uh, the coefficient of n cubed. So that's how that, that term pops out. And yes, I could work out all of these two, but right now I just don't care. <laughs> Um, it's the leading term that um, is of particular importance here. So, so this is what you do with any algorithm to uh, figure out uh, precisely how many um, how many flops it requires, just from seeing, taking the flops in individual steps and then taking the loops into account and using these summation formulas. Kind of pain, but it can be done. <clears throat> okay. Um, but yeah, the, the, so, so, so so this is our starting point um, for reducing the system to upper triangular form, and then once you've done that. Um, Here it is. So this is uh, the algorithm for back substitution described in a similar manner. So we're trying to solve the system of equations u x equals y, where u, the matrix u, is assumed to be upper triangular, and you have some given right-hand side. So we start with right-hand side values, and then from previous values, x values that we've substituted, we subtract terms off, and then we perform a division. Um, so this implements this process of back substitution. So here I have it written out using more general notation but still by three, three by three case. What do we always do? We start with the right hand side value and then any terms that correspond to previously found x values, subtract them off. You see that's happening here and here. And then, like in this case, it's x2 you're looking for. The last thing you'll do is divide by a22 that you see here. So divided by a11, as you see here. So right-hand side value, subtract off terms for later x values, uh, or already found x values, divide. And that's what we see here. So, so for example, suppose i is equal to n. We're working in the last equation. So you set your x value equal to your right-hand side value. And since i is equal to n, this loop goes for j equals n plus 1 to n, that means it won't run. Nothing will happen in that case. So then we just carry off the division. So it's just this, these two, this step and this step that are run. But first equation. Then when we go to the equation right above it, i is equal to n minus 1, we again assign the right-hand side value. j goes from n minus 1 plus 1 up to n. In other words, it goes from n to n. So this will run one time, then perform division. So each time through the loop, i is getting smaller and smaller. So this loop, this inner loop, will run more times, more iterations, um, and then we have the same kind of division every time. So, and here we have two levels of loops. So you can see from very intuitively why it requires order n squared operations. Now, number of loop levels doesn't always indicate complexity. It depends on how many iterations are being performed. Like, if one of these loops was performing a fixed number of iterations, like five, then 
that would not add an order of magnitude to the complexity. But here, this loop goes from n down to 1. This loop goes from i plus 1 up to n. Each one of these loops can perform as many as order n iterations. That's why we end up with the order n squared algorithm altogether. So, so what we've done here really is formalize the process that you learned in a first linear algebra course like 326, where you know, the, the, the process of forming Gaussian elimination on an augmented matrix, and then applying back substitution to the resulting upper triangular system to get the solution. Um, but and then we have, and then we know what algorithmic complexity is. We know how many points and operations are performed. Um, we've created an efficiency here by only carrying out this row operation on the columns within that the entries within that row that we need to do it on. Um, but other than that, there isn't really much of a distinction between what we see here and what you learned in a first three algebra class. At least not yet. Um, except for the heavy emphasis on algorithmic complexity. But that's going to change when I get into the next section of 3.2 on the LU decomposition, where, or for one thing, I'll explain why we don't actually work with the augmented matrix anymore. Um, and eventually we'll get into pivoting, so um, how we uh, decide to perform row interchanges, which is very different from a ordinary uh, um, pure linear algebra setting. Um, okay. So, um, so as, as, as we go through this, this chapter, more numerical um, issues will uh, come to the forefront. Um, but at least now, um, the gas elimination process you're familiar with, um, using two code like this, you, you can see how you get a um, MATLAB implementation um, based on these algorithms, um, without too much difficulty. <clears throat> okay, so any questions at this point? Um, oh wait, these are the okay. Uh, I think that I budgeted two whole class periods for what I just talked about today. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why did I do that? And so I'm looking back from the last time I taught this class two years ago, like, okay, these are first notes, and this is, a, this is really what I just did. Um, I thought, okay, what about the next class? Um, well, that's the next section. And it looks like I have one set of notes, because I've I budgeted three class periods for that. So I have to remember, okay, for cases where I've budgeted more than one class period per section, I only have one PDF for that section, so I should not go through the whole thing <laughs> necessarily. So, um, I was talking about was going too fast. Um, <laughs> I thought I had to get through it all in one day. I'm sure we'll do the next day. Um, I mean, I 
could just keep going. But um, well, okay. Um, what I will do after class for the very few minutes, I have okay. All the assignments are here, but um, I don't, and they're also in Canvas. But I, I'll put links to the assignments on the Canvas homepage, so you can go to that one page and get everything you need. Um, so. Um, and yeah, there's still a good amount of time until it's due. Um, and certainly we'll have time for questions on these as you, as you get into them. Um, so um, I guess you, you can start looking at this, at this section now. <laughs> um, okay. Um, let's see, so that would have been spring 2020. I'll, I'll look at the videos for that. <laughs> what if I do? Because um, right now all I have are these notes, but okay. Um, well, so, so it's good to know that I can go to a really nice pace with uh, LED composition because there, there's a lot to cover in that section, and it can be um, it, it can be difficult to digest. Um, okay. Well, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> so, okay. All right. Um, so I'll figure something out for Monday. Uh, whether I just continue or, 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 or uh, well, I'll also do is I'll look through this section and see if there's anything I forgot. But I don't think I did. No. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, cut the recording at this point, but I'll stick around in case anybody here or there has uh, any questions.